All right. Hello, everybody. Um, this is our next class video. Um, and I just want to reiterate, y'all, um, I really need you guys to watch these. Uh, I've been getting a couple of emails. I don't remember exactly how many, but uh, a couple of emails asking what the next assignment's going to be. And I'm like, oh, I kind of posted a video on Friday. I know I don't usually post on Friday, but we had the, you know, the weird holiday week. Um, <clears throat> but I think I explained it in pretty good detail what the next assignment is going to be, uh, which by the time you're watching this, I will be assigning it and have the assignment sheet up for it. So um, hopefully that'll give you a little bit, some written instructions on what the next essay is going to be. Um, but I am going to expand on, on what I talked about last time in this video. Uh, you're going to have some other options. Now, as I said last time, I'm ha combining um, the analysis and the evaluation essay into one assignment um, because they, you can't, you know, as I said, you can't evaluate without analyzing. You can, to an extent, you can analyze without evaluating. And an analysis, pure analysis means you're just breaking something down and looking at the components uh, and that, that could be where you stop. You know, for instance, like a, um, and, uh, well, so, you know, H2O, we all know what that is, right? Water. <clears throat> well, just through a simple analysis of water, uh, well, it wouldn't be simple. We're talking about literally an atomic level. But at an atomic level, um, the molecular structure of water is, what, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. That would be the end of the analysis. I'm not forming an opinion. I'm not putting my own thoughts into it. I'm not saying I think this is what water is, or I'm not explaining, you know, what water means. You know, aqua vitae of the water of life. All life is water. Blah blah. I'm not doing any of that. If I simply just say water is two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, I'm done. I just I just analyzed water to the atomic level. And if I stop there, that would be a pure analysis. But we're not, we're not doing that. We're doing an analysis and an evaluation, which means we would analyze, in other words, break it down, focus on individual pieces, um, the smaller things that make up the whole, and then evaluating on the, uh, which, what's the root word of evaluate, value. Okay, so we're looking at the value of each of those uh, individual components, like how well did this help the big, the big, the final thing, you know, whatever, whatever the end product is or result, whatever it may be, how did these individual parts contribute? Was it a positive contribution? Was it a negative contribution? Was it, did it not do anything really? So in a true analysis, um, opinion is not there. You know, what, what I just said about H2O, that's not my opinion. That's what it is. That's not me saying, well, you know, it could be this or it could be that, or perhaps it's, th that's what it is. Scientifically, uh, at, at an atomic level, that's water. It's H2O. Okay, so that's just pure analysis. Um, so when y'all start evaluating, you're gonna, you're gonna have an opinion and your overall opinion, your final judgment, if you will, is going to be your thesis. Um, and last time uh, I did, you know, I used the Day of the Dead film uh, as doing a film evaluation, and I was evaluating the film as a whole based on specific criteria uh, that I was using to analyze it. And I also said you can compare things, you know, but it has to be fair. You can use a compare and contrast analysis uh, and evaluation if you want. Um, now today I'm going to give you a, another option to start off with. And this is what we call a process analysis. Now, this is deceptively simple. Okay, well, I, I've assigned, I've given this option almost every time. I don't, I don't think I've, maybe when I first started, I didn't give this option uh, a long time ago, but I, I don't really remember. For at least the last 
10 or so years, I've given this option for the analysis essay and the now the analysis slash evaluation essay. So what is a process analysis? Well, it's almost self-explanatory, but it, again, it sounds deceptively simple. And, and by that, I mean that a lot of, well, not a lot, I don't want to say a lot. Some students in the past make the assumption that simple and easy are synonymous, that they mean the same thing, and they're not. But a process analysis is deceptively simple, meaning that it can get really, really complicated real fast, and you can find yourself in way over your head. Um, so what is a process analysis? You're explaining, and, and this is just my own definition, um, the, you're explaining how something works, basically. The process in which something works is uh, produced. Um, how something, I don't need to put that again, I can just keep going with this. How something is um, accomplished. And to give examples of a process analysis, um, I am going to oversimplify my first example as an illustration. Okay, um, I know since you know Food Network is around, has been around for a long time now. So I know that like cooking is a popular hobby that people have. Um, you know, amateur chefs, home cooks, they have like the competitions and all that stuff. Um, Cookbooks, for lack of a better term, are a compilation of process analyses. A cookbook is explaining to you the process of how to make something. You start off with X amount of ingredients. Um, you prepare those ingredients before. I mean, I'm talking prep is before you start cooking. Uh, you know, for instance, if you need to julienne an onion, if you just need a simple dice. Um, if you just need a chopped onion, um, if you need fine, um, finely, finely sliced carrots, or if you need thick sliced carrots, you know, all of that is going to be part of the process of you preparing to make what's going to be an end product, which would be the, whatever the meal is, whatever the dish that you're, that you're serving is. Um, so a process analysis is basically almost like a formal, um, written instruction booklet, but you don't write it like an instruction booklet and you wouldn't write it like a cookbook. This has to be a prose essay. You write it in complete sentences. It has to have formal structure. Um, if you want to use the five paragraphs, you can. But remember, that's pretty much the minimum. You want to have at least the five paragraphs. Uh, but you're not going to be writing it like this. Oops ingredients Ooh, that's an ingredients one teaspoon you're not going to write it out like that if you're doing a process analysis you're going to write it in prose um, it could be something like this Blah, 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 blah. The first thing we'll need is, and then you can list it, you know, uh, I, and you're going to write it. And remember, first person is okay for this one still. You can still write in first person. So it would be something like, you know, um, if we're going to make this dish, whatever it is, you know, the first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to have to head out to the local farmer's market because fresh is the only way to do this. Now, of course, in the way things are going right now in 2020, uh, <laughs> you might not be cruising out to the farmer's market. But you see what I'm saying? You have to write it as a piece of prose, as an essay. You're writing this as a complete text. It's not just a step one, blah, blah, blah. Step two, blah, blah, blah. Preheat oven to blah, blah, blah. If, if you do it like that, it's not going to, it's going to, I'm going to ask you to do it over because that's not the assignment. 
So don't think the process analysis is you just giving steps. That's not how you do it. You have to write an actual essay. Um, you can explain to someone, uh, for instance, you, you guys are all obviously college students. I've had students in the past write brilliant, extremely helpful process analysis essays on how to improve study habits. And what the student would, what the students did in these in these essays is they uh, basically wrote down what they were currently doing, what they did in the past that didn't work, how they improved, and what they did to stay on task. And you know, time management is is that's the basis of good study habits, right? You have to manage your time because we all have only X amount of hours in every day. We don't have time to do, you know, certain parts of our days are allocated for different tasks. We don't have a choice. And sometimes when we do have a choice, we don't always make the best choice. Trust me, um, you know, there's plenty of times when I should be doing something much more important and I might be watching a movie or playing a video game. Am I having fun? Yeah. Am I having a great time? Well, it depends what game it is. Uh, but probably something more effective I could be doing with my time. So you could write a process analysis that's very that's very personal. This is how I you know I was always terrible at studying and I tried to cram the night before and blah blah blah. But here's what I worked out and maybe this can work for you. So at that point it's a it's a process analysis, but you're also writing an essay that's kind of like a if you will kind of some, some kind of self help type thing, self improvement um, that might actually help other people. Um, and again, I'm, I'm offering you the chance, the uh, option of doing the process analysis, but I got to warn you that some people in the past have thought it would be very easy to explain something. And you're not allowed to use uh, no, no video, no illustrations, no diagrams. This is a 100% written assignment. So don't think you're just going to insert a bunch of images and, be, and write half two paragraphs and go oh there's three pages awesome uh, well you can do that but it's not gonna pass so this has to be a hundred percent text and explaining how to accomplish a task in text only is it can be very difficult um, one example that I've used in the past because it's so effective is uh, I asked and I've actually, when we have time in class, we're not in class, um, but I would have the students take a half an hour. And again, not everyone would know how to do this, but I said, you know, explain right now, get out pen, paper, whatever, get your laptop, whatever device, start typing, explain to someone who has never done it before how to change a flat tire on a car. Oh, that's easy. Oh, you just do the, the, the blah, blah, blah. Everybody's an expert who knows how to do it. It's a lot harder to write it down in step-by-step -step prose format and explain how to do it. First of all, what do you need to do? Where do you start? Oh, well, you start with the flat tire. So you're going to explain to someone how to change a flat tire after the tire is already flat. For that to happen, you have to be on the phone with them, which is going to be a nightmare. You either have to be there, and if you're there in person with the person and you already know how to do it, guess what? You're going to be changing that tire, not them. Okay, so it gets a lot more difficult when you put that into perspective. So think about it like this. Where would you start? Would you just start with, okay, well... First, you're going to need, what, what are you going to start out with the tools that you need? You obviously are going to need a jack, right? Most cars have a jack. Some used to, but they don't, or the person doesn't know where it is. What if they have no idea where their spare tire, or if they don't even have a spare tire? Yeah, my new car, the, the last car that I bought, didn't have a spare tire. It had a can of Fix-A-Flat and a little donut. So you see, it, it gets my point that I'm using this as an example is to show you how complicated it can be, because it's going to be different. You can't just universally tell someone 
specifically how to change a flat tire for their specific vehicle. You have to be broad enough that it's going to be applicable to most vehicles. And what I mean by most is the overwhelming majority. Uh, obviously, um, if you're telling the majority of your readers how to change a flat tire, you're going to assume that they have good, that they just have lug nuts and a lug wrench to take the to be able to take the lug nuts off the off the uh, wheel. But not all cars have lug nuts. What if they're driving a 1961 Triumph TR3. Those don't have lug nuts. Those have wire wheels with knockoffs. Center. That's a whole different ballgame. And that same car has tubes in the tires. If it's original, the, the, they have modern workarounds where they don't have where they have tubeless uh, tires on them now. But a real early 60s Triumph TR3 has tube tires with wire knockoff wheels. That that's a completely different ball game than changing your standard flat tire. So you see what I mean? It can get very complicated very quick. So you have to decide where to start and you want to reach the broadest audience possible. So I wouldn't even worry about the people with the early late 50s, early mid 60s British sports cars because chances are if they own one of those, they already know how to work on it. Trust me, I know this from experience, and I learned how to work on mine. Um, so look at your broadest audience. You're trying to reach the biggest amount of people possible, and you want it to be as applicable to as many people as possible. So we're not writing for a niche audience here. Okay, so if I were to be writing this little essay uh, process analysis on how to change a flat tire, I would tell them to get somewhere safe before they did anything. Okay, we live in Gwinnett County. If you you get a flat tire on I-85 or 316 or one of those big busy roads, you're not just going to tell them to stop where they're at. You might damage your wheel, so you want to stop immediately and get out and start changing that, jacking that car up and changing that tire. No. You stop in the middle of 316 or 85, a flat tire is going to be the least of your problems, and quite frankly, it will probably be your last problem, at period, ever, because you're not ever going to have another problem after that, if you get my drift. So don't be fooled by thinking the process analysis is easy. But it can also be really cool because you have to work yourself through something that you already know how to do and explain it to someone else who's never done it before. And it can be it can be fun because you you if you're doing the process analysis, y'all, you become the teacher, and every every one of your readers is is your student, and they're relying on you to accomplish whatever that task is. Um, so keep that in mind as a possibility. Um, you can do that one as well. Now, another option that you have that a lot of people, and I used to film because films are pretty universal. You know, a lot of people like to talk about movies. I do. I love talking about movies. Uh, so in the essay, if you want to do a film analysis evaluation, that's perfect too. But you can also do what I call an image analysis. And that would be, and I have to keep evaluation. So what that would be is you could do a photograph, you could do a painting, um, any any kind of piece of art. It could be a, it could be a sculpture. It could be. Um, well. Pretty much anything that, that there's an image of. One, one thing that, that's really interesting to do for an image analysis that contains a lot of different elements is you could, this is just a suggestion, you could evaluate advertising. Now advertising can be print, it can be film, video, whatever. You could commercials. TV ads, uh, banner ads, 
you all have, I mean, most of us have these dumb little things right here that are ironically called smartphones. We've got these. <clears throat> Every time you turn yours on, I'm sure that you go to whatever, Facebook or YouTube or any, whatever you go to, you're going to get ads somewhere. You go to Google, you go to uh, whatever search engine, there's ads all over the place. Advertisements are everywhere. And advertisements, particularly effective advertisements, and I don't mean good as in the, the ones everybody likes. I mean, what, what does an effective advertisement do? It sells stuff. Advertising is to either garner interest or sales, revenue, money. The best ads in the world for the companies that pay big bucks for them are the ones that get people to buy those products. You can have the most clever ad that people think is awesome, but if nobody knows what you're selling after the ad's over, that's not, an, in my opinion, that's not an effective advertisement. The ad agency might be proud as heck about it. Awesome, look what we did. We're going to win some awards for this one. But if the people finish watching the ad and they have no idea what the product is, so they don't buy the product, they talk about the ad, well, the company who paid a lot of money for that advertisement is losing because it did not serve its purpose. Therefore, it's not an effective advertisement at the end of the day because that's its purpose. All right. So those are things that you want to keep in mind. But ad advertising, uh, advertisement evaluations are, I think they're fun. I, I love them. I do them just, I do them for, for just for fun. You know, like, oh, well, you can, you can analyze music and evaluate it. You know, um, some of you may be musicians. Some of you may be very accomplished musicians. And you can talk about things. Now, you have to remember you're writing for a, gen for a general audience, though. So you have to write in terms that non-musicians will be able to understand. And that might require you to explain something. All right, so if you're using a specific term that applies, that that is mostly going to be used within the realm of musicians or that fellow musicians musicians that fellow musicians will understand but most people who are not musicians won't you just go ahead and explain it if you're using specific terms or jargon uh, you want to explain what it means you know uh, well this person and in, in this particular uh, verse of the song, the singer goes into a falsetto out of nowhere. It will tell us what a falsetto is. And you don't have to go crazy. I'm not talking about music theory. Just just give a basic explanation. This is what falsetto is. And if you're a singer, uh, do do it. Should give us an example. Um, I'm kidding. You can't do that in an essay. But Explain it, you know, give a give a reference, you know, for example, so and so if it's someone who's really popular sings falsetto and, and most readers, which is you can't reach all readers, you can reach most, most readers will go, oh, okay, so that's what they're talking about. Use references, use a point of reference that you think is going to reach a wider audience. Um, so you can do advertising. Uh, well, you could do music for uh, not an image analysis, but you could do music where you analyze a song. You could do, focus on the lyrics more than the music. Sometimes the lyrics and songs are just as or more important than the, than the music in the background. And, and again, this is what's most important to you because you're the one who is doing this. You're the author. So if I was doing... Um, evaluating a song, what if for me, um, if lyrics were most important, then that would be my top criterion. Now I talked about that in the previous video, so I'm not going to explain that again. Um, my top criterion for my song evaluation would be the lyrics. Now that's not me personally, I'm just using this as an example. Uh, but let's say for you, if it was the rhythm section, you know, if it's like a rock band or something like that, you know, the bass and the guitar. 
I mean, the bass and the drums, the rhythm section. So if you put, if the bass and the drums are what you like the most and what are most important to you, because they, you know, they're the, they're the railroad tracks that keep the rest of the song, the train, the rest of the song going. Without the bass and the drums, everything derails. If that's your opinion, then focus on that. Make that your top criteria. Now, if the lyrics aren't important, you know, some people like songs just for the music and the feeling, the way it makes them move, the way it makes them feel. They don't care how just completely void of any deep meaning or intellect that the lyrics are. The lyrics could be total nonsense. Or they may, or the singer's voice may be so beautiful, which would be music in itself, that the singer's voice is so beautiful that that person could be singing the phone book and it would sound great. So the lyrics themselves are not important. It's the way that the person projects them. Uh, so these are all things that are, you decide. This is stuff that you decide. You're the judge. You are the one making the evaluation and you are the one making the final judgment. Let the readers know what is most important to you though, so that we know how you're evaluating it. And so like I said in the last video, the, as far as what you can analyze and evaluate, it's virtually anything. I mean, it, anything. It is, it, this is for topic choices. This is so wide open that I, don't, I can't think of anything that would be more wide open. Um, so I'm giving you a lot of choices, but they are all, regardless of what you choose, they're all going to have the same basic elements. Um, for an image analysis, you can also look at something like a, a just like a regular painting. You know, like uh, I'll show you one, and I'll just give a little bit of background. This is one of my favorite paintings. I'm going to go full screen here for a minute, um, and I will blow this up. So let's go up to here. And this is uh, The Luncheon of the Boating Party by Renoir. Um, this was completed in 1881, and it's just a gorgeous painting. Now, there are so many different ways that you could analyze something like this. Uh, they actually have done scientific analysis on this particular painting. And this painting, by the way, is huge. Um, <coughs> That's also something that you want to let your audience be aware of, because I'm assuming that most of us, including myself, have never seen this thing in real life. Um, I have seen a couple of Renoirs in real life, but this one, this was not one of them. And until I actually looked it up um, at the, actual, the, the dimensions of it, I had no idea how big this painting is. This painting is 51 by 68 inches. So from here to here is 5.8 inches, cross to cross. And then up here, we've got 51 inches. I mean, this is an enormous painting. Most people would have no clue that, it's, that this is that big. Um, I know I sure didn't until I read it, and I was really, really shocked. Uh, so that's going to make an impression on, and ha, ha, ha. This is an impressionist painting, in case you didn't know, so my little pun there. That's going to give an impression to the reader immediately when they see how big it is. Um, but here's the deal. If you're going to do an analysis of a painting or an advertisement, you can include an appendix to your essay that contains that shows a picture of it at the end of the essay as an additional, uh, as an appendix, which means it does not count as part of the length requirement, the three pages, none of that. But if you want to put it in there as a reference for your reader, you can, but I would prefer that you don't. They can look it up on their own if they want, but I want to see how well you can describe it and explain the elements of it without the visual aid. That would be the challenge of doing one of these. Now, when I was talking about they scientifically analyzed this, they x-rayed it because there was a lot of uh, speculation as to whether Renoir used live models for this or not. And through some journals, they found out that, yes, in fact, he did use live models for this. 
and through x-ray analysis they found out that one of the women there's I think 14 people in this I'm not sure uh, but one of the women and I believe it was this one right here that I'm pointing at through x-ray analysis they found out that there was somebody else there when he started doing this painting that he had completely scraped scraped off well not completely because through x-ray analysis they could still see the penciled in and it was a completely different woman standing there in a different pose and he went back and got somebody else because apparently this person was not to his liking or couldn't stand still or I, I have no idea it's all speculation of why as to why but um yeah he actually went back and put a different person in right here in this particular place um, so you could analyze the actual physical makeup of the painting you know the the paint they've done chemical analyses on the paint to see what he was using to mix it because back then when this came out a lot of painters had to mix their own paints this is right around the time when tube paints were coming out but we don't know for sure that that's what he used exclusively or if he had to mix his own for parts of it uh, so there's a lot of that. Now you can just look at the image itself. You know, look at all these people. They're all looking at something. Like this person appears to me like she's looking at this guy. And she looks kind of like she's interested in this guy. But look what he's doing. He's looking at somebody else who's looking at somebody else. These two are clearly looking at each other. Or are they? She's looking at her little pooch. But he's looking at her. This dude's looking way over here. These people, so everybody's looking kind of somewhere else and it looks like they're all interested in somebody who is not interested in them. Um, so, the, you know, there's a lot of weird dynamics going on here. You can look at his technique, the way he, the, the brush strokes, the color palette. Um, the light and shadow. This is a very bright painting. But it gets really dark over here. Over here, it's very bright. You know, look how the shadows are falling from over here. And here we've got the bright sunlight hitting right on the side of her hat. Um, it's hitting the front of his straw, the individual straws in his straw hat over here. Um, looks like everybody's at the bottom of their glass. So. There's obviously been some drinking going on. That bottle's empty. This one's well on its way. This one's well on its way. Uh, she's turning it up right now. So, hey, maybe they're feeling a little bit looser than they were when they started. Somebody's saying something right here she doesn't want to hear. She's covering her ears, and this guy's got his arm around her. Or is that somebody else's arm? We don't really know. Okay, and this guy's just looking way off at nothing. And he appears a little overdressed, doesn't he? He's got a top hat on. He's got a full coat. These guys are just wearing kind of summer clothes. So my point is, is that there's, there's a lot you can do when you're analyzing these things. But when you evaluate it, you'd have, to, you'd have to give an opinion on why you think that... Well, you, an example would be you could, you could argue as to why you think that Renoir chose these, this specific scene and why why was was it to cause mystery was it for was it for intrigue um was it supposed to look uh a little saucy you know whatever uh that's what you're going to be doing when you're doing this analysis slash evaluation but at the end of the day it's your own well-supported opinion and you don't need now if you if you want to use outside sources on this, you can use no more than three. If you want to, you can use up to three outside sources, but I would really prefer that you don't. This one, I would prefer you just use your own thoughts. Um, I don't, I really wouldn't, I would like for you not to do any outside research on whatever it is you choose to analyze and evaluate. I want what you think. You know, I don't care what the so-called experts think or whatever. We, I, I can look there garbage up anytime I want. I want to hear what you think. But if you really, really need to use an outside source, it has to be extremely limited. And you have to use the proper citations that I lay out in, in the uh, MLA guide I gave you. You have to have the internal parenthetical citations and you have to have a works cited page. 
I haven't gone over that in any of our classes yet because I'm not requiring it. But you, you can if you really need to. I would advise you not to. I'd say I, I just want to know what you think. I want to know what your genuine thoughts are. And even though they're your opinions, they still have to be supported. So you're going to have to support them through examples, like I just did with that painting. You know, well, these people are clearly have been drinking as based on my evidence would be the empty, half empty bottles. The glasses are all empty. Uh, the cheeks are a little bit rosy on some of the folks, you know, little might have been hitting the sauce for a while, that type of stuff. But your thesis at the end of the day is what you think. And your goal through the rest of that essay and the body paragraphs is to prove it to the best of your ability. And to get as many people as possible to say, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I, 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 I think I agree with you. Good, good job. That's, that's it. So simple, not easy. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and call it quits there uh, for tonight or today, this morning, whenever y'all are watching this. And I guess I'll just see y'all next time. So take care, and I will be getting your uh, your revisions back to you very, very soon if you submitted one. All right.